Okay, so good morning, everybody. This is uh, nephro our nephrology um, clinical conference, um, and welcome to everybody. Before I start, I want to, you know, this has been a really tough time with COVID, and uh, we're just past Thanksgiving, a week and a half, and I want to, you know, um, uh, discuss some things I'm thankful for. Uh, well, you may be thankful that it's not going to be a COVID discussion again, but I am thankful that the vaccine is coming. I'm also uh, very thankful for um, a superb nephrology team, which has worked really, really hard at this COVID time. I'm very fortunate as well to work with a superb team of nephrologists, uh, um, a really superb team. And, and two nephrologists in our group are going to are going to join me in this presentation. Um, one is uh, Dr. Shastri, a, a superb nephrologist who joined us seven years ago, um, as well as uh, Dr. Gandhi, who uh, joined us uh, about uh, uh, about seven or so months ago, and has been a great addition to the group. And uh, looking forward to a great future for the whole team as we get through uh, COVID as well. So we're going to present a patient um, with AKI and vascular disease, vascular diseases. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shastri. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start by presenting the case. So the chief complaint is resistant hypertension. And um, our story kind of starts really in the spring of 2019. We had a 65-year-old female, and she presented to her cardiologist with a complaint of resistant hypertension. So she had been diagnosed with hypertension many years prior, and she had been tried on various medication regimens, um, but still remained hypertensive. Next slide, please. So her past medical history, as I mentioned, resistant hypertension, she had anxiety, depression, uh, chronic kidney disease and hypothyroidism. Um, past surgical history was notable only for tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy. Family history, her mother had um, arthritis. Her mother also had chronic kidney disease and hypertension. Father had diabetes and hypertension as well. And she had a strong family history of both breast and colon cancer on uh, her, both her maternal and paternal sides of the family. Social history, um, she is married with three children and she was an active smoker at least a half a pack a day since she estimated 2005, uh, probably longer than that. Next slide, please. So uh, pertinent medications, uh, she was on amlodipine 10 milligrams daily. She was on a baby aspirin, furosemide 20 milligrams daily. She was on hydralazine, 50 milligrams TID, and this had been started back in 2016 initially at a, a low dose of like 10 milligrams TID and had been titrated up um, to the 50 milligrams TID she was on at the time of the presentation. She was on hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams daily, herbosartan, 300 milligrams daily, uh, her levothyroxine, statin, and then metoprolol, 100 milligrams daily. So on review systems, she was positive for atypical chest pain, which was um, rare at the time. She also complained of some occasional shortness of breath and some lower extremity edema. Notably, she also had a uh, pretty um, significant weight loss, like 25 pounds or so over the last year. Her physical exam was notable. She was a very small woman at the time. She'd lost significant weight. Her BMI was 18. Um, she was mildly hypertensive with a blood pressure of 142 over 72. She was bradycardic with a heart rate of 50. Um, and her exam was really only notable for the mild bradycardia. She didn't have any murmurs on exam. She had one plus bilateral bow extremity ping edema. Um, her chest exam was uh, unremarkable and she didn't have any rashes. So her labs at that initial time of presentation, if you uh, look at the creatinine, her baseline creatinine has been anywhere from about 0.9 to 1.2. Um, so at the last uh, three checks, it had been about 1 to 1.1. Um, back in May of 2018, she had some mild hyponatremia. So her creatinine was about 1 to 1.1 at the time. Um, do you remember that she was a very small woman and she had very low muscle mass. So this was still significant. Uh, chronic kidney disease stage three, probably estimated GFR in the 40s to 50s. So her blood pressure remained variable, ranging anywhere from the 130s to 160s. Um, as I mentioned, she developed some issues. Uh, she was mildly bradycardic, uh, 
and this was resulted in reduction of her metoprolol, and she had some intermittent hyponatremia, and at that point, her um, hydrochlorothiazide was stopped. So in May of 2019, her cardiologist performed a renal artery duplex because of the concern with her ongoing difficult to control hypertension. And this showed increased velocities in the renal arteries bilaterally. Uh, based on this study, the cardiologist concluded that she had hemodynamically significant stenosis bilaterally. So at this point, she had a confirmatory study. In September of 2019, she had an MRI angiogram of the abdomen and this showed a single left renal artery, which was patent at the origin, but approximately six millimeters distal to the origin of the left renal artery was a focal severe short segment area of stenosis. In the right side, um, they noted moderate to severe narrowing of the right renal artery, and they made an incidental note of an accessory renal artery supplying the lower pole of the kidney. So um, here is a picture of the MRI angiogram. So you can see the yellow arrow shows um, that um, marked stenosis that I mentioned on the left side, and then the red arrow is showing us the stenosis on the right side. So at this point, the patient began having more frequent episodes of atypical chest pain. And uh, so in June of 2020, she had a coronary angiogram and a renal angiogram. And the coronary angiogram showed normal coronaries, normal LV function, but there was about 60 to 70% stenosis in the left renal artery um, and a Herculeic renal artery stent was placed. The patient was started on clopidogrel along with the aspirin she was already on. Mention was made of diffuse disease in the right renal artery and um, the right accessory renal artery was mentioned as well, but no intervention was done on this side. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Grief and he is gonna talk to us a little bit about renal artery stenosis. Thank you, Shuba. So the question comes up about renal, renal vascular disease and hypertension and when to revascularize and what is the data. First, I want to review secondary causes of hypertension. And these are uh, some of the causes uh, that we see in the office and we think about. One is medication-induced and they include non steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, oral contraceptives, steroids, calcineurin inhibitors such as tacrolimus and cyclosporin, angiogenesis inhibitors, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors, illicit drug use, renal disease, primary hyperaldosteronism, often manifested with a low potassium, which is even on the borderline low range, renal vascular disease, obstructive sleep apnea, theochromocytoma, and Cushing's, the last two being quite uncommon. But in this case, I want to talk about renal vascular disease because that seems to be the elephant in the room. Renal vascular hypertension was first described um, by a pathologist who actually graduated from McGill, my alma mater, and hence why I will mention him very proudly. So he noticed at autopsy, he was a pathologist, he noted narrowing of the renal arteries in patients with hypertension. To test this hypothesis, he clamped the renal arteries in dogs and observed the rise in blood pressure. Later, it was, described, it was discovered that the hormone renin, it, renin is a mediator of the hypertension. And it was often, it was usually met, it was measured in gold blood units initially before it was termed uh, renin. I just want to show you what he described being um, uh, in the two kidney model where you would clip one side, the blood pressure would go up and the renin levels would be high and the patient would be normal bulimic. If you have one kidney with and clip that renal artery, in fact, the renin levels may be normal but at the cost of a very high blood pressure. And this is the same thing that would happen if you had two kidneys and two stenoses. Often a normal renin, but high volume and high blood pressure. So what renal artery stenosis does is that it stimulates renal, renin release from the kidney, which, catabolize, which uh, uh, converts angiotensin, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin converting enzyme from the lungs converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is an extremely powerful vasoconstrictor. And as well, it acts on the adrenal gland to stimulate release of aldosterone, which contributes to salt and water reabsorption by the kidney. So renal artery stenosis, when we see it, is much more often seen in patients with atherosclerotic disease and fibromuscular dysplasia. Fibromuscular dysplasia 
I will not mention any further than saying that it's often seen in young women and is quite, uh, is quite uncommon. Now, renal artery stenosis is seen in one to 5% of patients with hypertension. And it's as high as 7% of patients with hypertension uh, if the patient's more than 65 years of age. The clues for diagnosis of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis are an onset of severe hypertension after the age of 55, unexplained deterioration of kidney function during an ACE or ARB therapy, especially of more than 50% rise in the creatinine, presence of diffuse atherosclerosis, presence of an unexplained, uh, of an unexplained atrophic kidney or renal asymmetry of renal sizes more than 1.5 centimeters, episodes of acute flash pulmonary edema or refractory CHF, with impaired kidney function, as well as a systolic diastolic brewing, which lateralizes to one side. So what happens? Why does an ACE or ARB decrease renal function in these patients? Well, these patients have renal artery stenosis, and what ends up happening is that decreases blood flow into the glomerulus. This is a stylized picture of the glomerulus. To maintain GFR, angiotensin II constricts the efferent arterial to maintain increased glomerular filtration pressure. So in fact, it's the constriction of the efferent arterial in renal artery stenosis that's maintaining GFR. If you take away the angiotensin II, that will decrease glomerular pressure and decrease GFR. And it's often reversible, usually reversible, when you stop the ACE inhibitor or the angiotensin receptor blocker. What are the associations with renal artery stenosis? They have a higher risk of chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, all complications uh, of the vascular disease. The diagnostic testing for renal artery stenosis, renal arteriography is the gold standard, but because of the concern over contrast, dye, and accessing the arterial circulation, we have alternatives. One which is used much more, which is used most commonly is a duplex Doppler ultrasound, otherwise CT angiography, and as in this patient, a magnetic resonance angiography. Selective, renin, uh, selective renal vein renin measurements are not useful as initial diagnostic tests for renal artery stenosis and are really basically never done. What are the treatments for renal artery stenosis? One is medical treatment, percutaneous renal angioplasty, usually with stent placement or surgical revascularization. I cannot remember the last time that a surgical revascularization was planned solely for the treatment of renal artery stenosis causing hypertension. Who would you consider treatment for renal artery stenosis? Well, a short duration of blood pressure elevation prior to the diagnosis of renal artery disease, failure of optimal, optimal medical therapy to control the blood pressure, intolerance to optimal medical therapy, or recurrent flash pulmonary edema and or refractory heart failure. So what is the data for stenting for atherosclerotic renal artery disease? There are two studies that were done the astral study and the coral study, both done in the last decade or so. Let's talk about the astral study, which was published in 2009. They look at the effect of renal artery revascularization on renal outcomes. They randomized 806 patients with atherosclerotic renal artery disease. It was non-blinded and they were randomized to medical therapy plus or minus endovascular renal artery revascularization. And they had to have substantial renal artery disease and at least one renal artery. There was really no significant difference in renal function. It was small. There may have been one 100, you know, one microgram of creatinine per mil, which is a, a fraction of, of, of a creatinine measurement, but there were very small differences between medical therapy and revascularization, so much so that the serum creatinine was almost was really almost the same. So this is in um, hundreds of micromoles per liter, which is in approximately two, because it's 90 micrograms per mole per liter per one milligram per deciliter of creatinine. This is in SI units. If we take a look at the, the effect on blood pressure, there was no difference in blood pressure between the medical therapy and the revascularization group, neither in the systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure. The next study that came out about five years later was a coral study. And they looked at stenting and medical therapy for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. And they randomized 947 participants with atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis with either systolic hypertension, with 
than either systolic hypertension with two or more drugs or CKD. And they followed them for occurrence of adverse cardiovascular and renal events. They were deaths from cardiovascular renal events, MI, stroke, hospitalization for CHF or fallen renal function or need for dialysis. And the CORAL study showed no benefit in that event-free survival, that, that group of endpoints between stent or medical therapy alone. As you can see, this, this group of patients over five years has a high risk of endpoints. This is a, a group of patients with a high risk of cardiovascular events and, and renal events. So no matter what, in five years, they, they, they have a 50% event rate but stent therapy did not make a difference. And there were no differences in specific clinical endpoints. And they were all non-significant. And I, I'm gonna highlight two of them, one being hospitalization for congestive heart failure, and the other one, permanent dialysis, permanent renal replacement therapy. In fact, there was a trend, although I, I hate to mention trends with having uh, Dr. Bress in our group, who's a statistical maven, in that there was this trend for stenting having an increased risk of permanent renal replacement therapy. What were the criticisms of the studies? Number one, they were stable patients. There was some crossover. There was about 6% crossover in the astral trial. And the, what about the degree of stenosis? Maybe these patients weren't sick enough. The stenosis wasn't significant enough to show a significant effect. And so in 2015, Murphy in, in, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology looked at, at the astral trial and he looked at the outcomes based on the degree of stenosis. And you can see the, steno the groups of stenosis were based on less than 60%, 60 to 80%, and more than 80%. And there was no difference in the outcome between the stent group and the medical treatment group. There was no difference based on baseline systolic blood pressure on the outcome nor the peak systolic pressure gradient across the stenosis. So why does this occur? So, re and one explanation can come from a study that was published in Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation 2010. And what they did is they took 62 patients who had a nephrectomy of an atrophic kidney for uncontrolled hypertension and vascular disease between 1990 and 2000. And these patients were older, around 65, 45% male. A large percentage of these patients had intrarenal disease. 39% of the subject had evidence of astroemboli, and 52% had hypertensive vascular changes. Let's take a look at, at pictures of two of those pathologic studies. On the left, you can see that the patient had large vessel renal artery stenosis in the kidney. It was, look at the onion skinning around that blood vessel, severe stenosis, and you can't imagine much blood flow going to the kidney with such severe renal, uh, small vessel renal vascular disease. On the right, you can see evidence of cholesterol emboli. Many of these patients had procedures and as they had vascular disease, and you can see the cholesterol emboli occluding the, uh, the, 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 the arterioles. So, that being said, I, do, I don't want to put a complete uh, negative, neg negative uh, uh, view on, re on the treatment of renal artery stenosis and renal vascularization, because we do have cases and we do send some patients for revascularization, knowing full well that it, in fact, in the studies that these were very stable patients. And I wanna present a patient who was taken care of by doctors Chenapati and Sue uh, several years ago. She was 64. She had severe vascular disease and she had a single kidney because the other kidney was removed, I think for cancer, and she had uncontrolled hypertension. And you can see in 2013 and 2014, she, these are creatinines on the, on, the, on the left and you can see her she had an episode of AKI and slowly rising creatinine. And she presented with the AKI in 2014 with a creatinine up to four and a half and she was oligaric and she had congestive heart failure. And she had renal artery stenting and you can see that her kidney function returned to close to normal. And in fact, I, I think she has since passed and it had nothing to do with her renal vascular disease. So what happened to our case? At this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Shastri to discuss, uh, to, to discuss the evolution of, the, of our case. 
So after uh, the renal artery stent was placed um, in August 2020, the patient was then referred to pulmonary because she was experiencing worsening shortness of breath. And she was diagnosed with COPD at the time. And she had a CT, which showed bilateral pleural effusions. Um, shortly afterward, later that month, she was then admitted to Newark Wayne with severe shortness of breath. And she had a CTP protocol at this time. Uh, did not show a P, but it showed increased size of the pleural effusions. So during her hospitalization, uh, she was diuresed with IV Lasix and she had thoracentesis. The pleural fluid was transidative and it was negative for malignancy. And because it was transidative, there was a concern for congestive heart failure. She was seen by cardiology, but they did not feel um, that she had congestive heart failure. And what happened with her blood pressure? Her blood pressure was actually low at this time and most of her antihypertensive medications were stopped. Um, her creatinine increased from her baseline, which if you recall was about 0.9 to 1.2 up to 2.3. Um, it did come down a little bit at the time of her discharge. It was 1.96 and uh, she was discharged from the hospital with uh, a referral to nephrology. She was then seen by Dr. Gandhi uh, pretty shortly after her discharge in August 2020. Her blood pressure was noted to be high at the time, but most of her medications had been stopped, so the amlodipine was restarted. Um, it was felt that the AKI in the hospital may have been due to IV contrast with the CTP protocol and also the diuresis, but there was also concern that she had an instant thrombosis because she had recently had that renal artery stent placed just two months prior. So renal artery dopplers were ordered, but however, these showed a patent stent. So then she was brought back um, shortly afterwards in September, 2020. Um, at that visit with Dr. Gandhi, she was significantly more short of breath than at the previous visit. Um, a urinalysis at that time was significant for both hematuria and proteinuria. She had blood work done, um, which showed uh, a creatinine up to 3.11, which was higher obviously than when she left the hospital. And it showed a positive ANA, a high titer ANA, and also a very high titer ANCA, P ANCA positive. At that point, because of worsening renal function and concern for ANCA vasculitis, uh, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, she was sent to RGH for renal biopsy. And she was started on pulse dose steroids, solumedrol 500 milligrams IV daily for three days, then transitioned to oral prednisone. Her aspirin and clopidogrel were held for five days. And at that point, she then had a renal biopsy. So the renal biopsy results showed very focal crescentic necrotizing glomerulonephritis, but this was only seen in one out of 39 glomeruli. Also an increased number of occlusive red blood cell tubular casts with acute tubular necrosis was noted. So here is a, the slide uh, from her biopsy and you can see I've highlighted in yellow the crescent that they mentioned. So a crescent is sort of a layers of proliferating cells that form this is sort of a hallmark of severe glomerular injury. So given the biopsy findings, um, her history, the positive ANA, the renal pathologist felt that she may actually have something called drug-induced ANCA vasculitis. And the pathologist specifically cited the patient's use of hydralazine as a potential cause. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gandhi, who's going to talk to us about um, this diagnosis. Thank so while you, he's Dr. putting, Dr. yeah, while you're yeah. putting that up, I do see yeah. one question on the Q&A, and we'll try to answer the questions at the end. You can go ahead and put up your presentation. Uh, please can ask you your questions on the, on the Q&A bar. Yes, we can see your screen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shastri and Dr. Grief for a great presentation. Um, I'm gonna present about drug induced ANCA vasculitis as uh, Dr. Shastri mentioned, that was a diagnosis. Uh, first of all, this is a very rare disease and there's not very strong data because of the rarity of the disease, but I will try my best uh, to present the evidence out there associated with this disease. 
So before I start uh, talking about drug induced ANCA, uh, briefly mention about uh, history of ANCA vasculitis in general. Uh, so uh, uh, the disease like ANCA vasculitis uh, has been described more than a century ago by Peter McBride, where uh, he noticed that uh, these patients presented with necrotizing vasculitis and granulomatous disease um, uh, involving respiratory tract and uh, kidney is causing glomerulonephritis. And then uh, back in 1954, uh, Goodman and Chirk, uh, uh wrote a detailed description of uh, uh, disease known as Wegener's granulomatosis. Nowadays, it is called as uh, GPA, granulomatosis uh, with polyangitis. And uh, uh, again, the presentation was similar with necrotizing granulomata with respiratory tract involvement and uh, glomerulonephritis. Uh, this year was very important because Fauci and Wolf introduced a treatment with uh, cyclophosphamide and corticosteroids uh, uh, for uh, this disease called as Wegener's granulomatosis with excellent results and nearly complete and long lasting remission of the disease. And I want you to pay attention to this slide because you're right, this is Anthony Fauci. So from uh, anchor vasculitis to COVID-19 to HIV, he has done everything, like a great physician scientist. Uh, very important, he was just 32 years old, almost what I am now, when he did that. I, um, then um, uh, back in 1985, there was a major breakthrough uh, came in because they were able to detect antibodies associated with this disease. And uh, these antibodies, uh, they found out that, uh, you know, they reacted to cytoplasm of ethanol fixed neutrophils and monocytes. And uh, the name hence uh, came from that uh, called as anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibodies. Uh, so briefly about ANCA associated systemic vasculitis. So it is uh, you know, one of the vasculitis which affects the small vessels, uh, including arterioles, venules, capillaries, and uh, sometimes uh, medium sized arteries too. Uh, it is very uh, rare to see, but the incidence has been increasing. And the reason behind that is because it is more and more, uh, uh, you know, being taught. And uh, we now have this, uh, uh, you know, availability of uh, ANCA antibodies and capability to measure that. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the diagnosis is being done more uh, frequently. Uh, then finally, it is a posse immune uh, vasculitis. Uh, posse immune meaning if we take the biopsy sample, uh, uh, it is very rare to see immune uh, immunoglobulin or complement deposits on the biopsy. Uh, itself. Uh, there are mainly two types of ANCA antibodies. There are a few other which I will go in my uh, like future slides. Uh, but uh, main two ANCA antibodies are uh, C ANCA and P ANCA. It is based on the immunofluorescence, uh, how it stains uh, with uh, you know cytoplasmic staining, uh, uh, you know indicating C ANCA and perinucleus staining indicating uh, P ANCA. C ANCA correlates uh, with uh, PR3 or proteinase 3 antibodies and uh, the activity and the P ANCA staining correlates with myeloperoxidase antibody staining. Um, so coming on to drug induced ANCA vasculitis. So uh, more recently, you know, uh, researchers have been seeing and more and more case reports um, have been coming out, um, uh, you know, attributing uh, certain drugs uh, towards causing this vasculitis, who also on top of causing vasculitis, they have positive ANCA antibodies. And um, um, uh, like the, this is the most important list, you know, to keep in mind because there are few drugs that this list we do prescribe quite often and we see a lot of patients are on these drugs. Um, well, uh, starting with antibiotics, cefotexime and minocycline has been attributed uh, to drug-induced ANCA vasculitis, uh, then antithyroid drugs, um, uh, including uh, methimazole, carbimazole, propyl thiouracil, and benzyl uh, thiouracil. Then anti TNF alpha agents uh, like adalimumab, etarnasept, infliximab, psychoactive agents like clozapine, thioridazine, and uh, 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 other drugs like allopurinol, penicillamine, hydralazine, uh, uh, levomisole, and phenytoin and sulfasalazine. Among all these uh, uh, drugs, uh, the most common ones are antithyroid drugs, um, hydralazine and minocycline. And among these drugs, hydralazine is the most common cause of uh, drug-induced ANCA vasculitis. A short note on uh, levomisole. Uh, 
So nevamisole um, is an anti-parasitic drug. And uh, why it is important to know about why levamisole causes drug-induced vasculitis is because 70% of illegal cocaine sold in the U.S. Uh, is contaminated with levamisole. Um, I was very curious, you know, uh, to you know find out why uh, somebody would uh, mix uh, antiparasitic drug with cocaine. So it it turns out that it has a st co-stimulatory effect to enhance the effect of cocaine, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, it increases their profit margin because. They, it's not cocaine, they're mixing it with a cheaper, uh, you know, drug in that. So very important to know because a lot of times we see uh, at RGH, all the time we see these cocaine uh, abusers and, you know, history of cocaine abuse. And if uh, you have concerns, like, you know, they are presenting with pulmonary renal syndrome or uh, just like, um, you know, uh, uh, like uh, acute kidney injury and we cannot explain and they have protein and blood in the urine, um, um, very important to think about and check cocaine, uh, check for cocaine abuse in these patients. So epidemiology, well, uh, this is, you know, there are no clear, clear data on the prevalence, but there are a few studies here and there, uh, you know, uh, which kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, elicit, you know, just, just present that uh, there, uh, for example, the study uh, published out of China, they said that uh, Anka associated vasculitis or drug induced anka vasculitis uh, in patients using propyl thiouracil. So they found out 22.6% had positive anka antibody and 6.5% actually had clinical evidence of anka associated vasculitis. Uh, then there is another study um, uh, published in 2005 in Arthritis Rheumatology Journal. And uh, they said again uh, with this antithyroid drugs, 11% had anka antibody positive and 4% um, uh, developed ANCA-associated vasculitis, uh, secondary drug use. Uh, then pathogenesis. So before, you know, there, first of all, because it's such a rare disease, but there are few pathogenesis associated with drugs, which I'm going to mention uh, next slides. But before that, it is very, very important to know um, uh, the pathogenesis, the basic pathogenesis associated with ANCA vasculitis in general. Uh, so I have this uh, video, which I'm going to, uh, you know, present and uh, explain to you how the basic of anka vasculitis works. So again, you know, this is an autoimmune disease and like other autoimmune disease, it involves um, antigen presenting cell, T cell, neutrophils and B cells. Uh, B cells, you know, uh, are responsible uh, for forming anka antibodies. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the start of this, you know, uh, cascade of anka vasculitis happens uh, because of the interaction between neutrophils and endothelial cell uh, present in the vessel wall. Um, and any triggers like infection or environmental factors, uh, they produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. And what pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines does is they uh, do the priming of uh, the neutrophils. And uh, uh, as we know that we call them as granulocytes because they have granules in them. Uh, so these granules contain MPO and PR3 um, uh, antigen. And what it does is this uh, MPO and PR3 uh, get surfaced to the cell and uh, attracts ANCA antibodies. And when ANCA attaches with MPO, PR3, and FC receptor, it actually uh, changes the configuration of the adhesion molecules present on the surface of neutrophils. And this leads to, you know, uh, the start of this uh, local inflammatory reaction uh, uh, by reactive oxygen species, proteolytic enzymes, and alternating component pathway, and uh, uh, produce a severe uh, uh, inflammatory reaction. In addition to that, neutrophils also release pro-inflammatory cytokines, which attracts more and more uh, neutrophils uh, in the area, producing uh, you know the severe uh, 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 necrotizing damage. And um, um, again, similar thing happens to the monocytes. And uh, monocytes, uh, they actually uh, mature into macrophage and uh, squeeze out of, uh, around the, uh, into the surrounding uh, uh, perivascular uh, tissue. And uh, uh, basically, again, you know, produce more and more damage uh, in the surrounding area too. And uh, the end result of this is, uh, um, you know, it causes fibrinoid necrosis. And this fibrinoid necrosis, uh, you know, obviously uh, leads to this hemorrhage uh, 
uh, in the surrounding area and uh, uh, leakage of RBCs. And when it happens in the lungs, uh, it leads to pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. When it happens in the glomerulus, it leads to hematuria. Uh, few of these patients can develop um, um, you know, thromboembolism as a result of that. But the end result of because of this damage in the blood vessel, it causes narrowing of uh, uh, the lumen and uh, you know uh, decreasing the blood flow uh, to the vital organs and uh, pr producing more damage. Um, so you know, uh, so there are few. Uh, you know, first of all, it is not very clear or fully understood that how drug-induced um, anchor antibodies are produced. But uh, uh, we know that all these different categories of drug they produce similar autoimmune profile, which I will go over in my next slides. Uh, the lab. Uh, lab associations with drug induced vasculitis. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, we know that these drugs, they are a low molecular weight and uh, they need uh, formation of complex to stimulate antibody formation and then to drive immune response. So there is one mechanism uh, they have described in one of the studies published in 1995 uh, that activated neutrophils uh, in the presence of hydrogen peroxidase, they release MPO or myeloperoxidase from their granules. And this myeloperoxidase in turn uh, convert the offending drugs such as propylthiouracil and hydralazine into cytotoxic products. And again, you know, these cytotoxic products in turn, you know, turns immunogenic for T cells, which eventually leads to production of anti-antibodies, which does the damage like I showed in, uh, in the previous uh, video. Then uh, sulfur salazine, um, uh, they mentioned that sulfur salazine can induce um, uh, neutrophil apoptosis. And when the neutrophil apoptosis happens in the absence of timing, uh, it again causes a translocation of the ANCA antigens to the cell surface, which then induce the production of ANCA. Um, and uh, then ANCA in turn again causes the damage I showed you previously. Um, so I found this uh, very interesting, the use of TNF alpha inhibitor. Uh, I was not aware of that when I was preparing the slide that it can lead to anti-acidic vasculitis. Uh, so how it does is basically TNF alpha inhibitor we use in, uh, uh, in diseases which have uh, which are driven by T helper one cell profile like rheumatoid arthritis. And um, what happens when the uh, TNF alpha inhibitor is given to patients uh, their immune profile uh, shifts from T helper one cell to T helper two driven. And uh, we know that uh, uh, diseases like SLE and uh, anca vasculitis, they are uh, in fact um, uh, T helper two cell driven uh, diseases. And just by doing that, because shifting the profile, it uh, up regulates the antibody production and causing um, uh, the drug induced anca vasculitis. The other uh, mechanism, proposed mechanism, is uh, because you know it is an immunosuppressant, so in uh, it it increases the incidence of clinical and subclinical infection, bacterial infections, and uh, when that happens, you know it um, infection itself can act as immunostimulant, uh, and again uh, because of uh, the shift in profile from Th1 to Th2, it leads to more antibody production. Um, there is also possible genetic link described. Uh, this was a study, uh, you know, which uh, was uh, which uh, studied six patients um, who developed ANCA drug-induced ANCA vasculitis uh, with minocycline, and four out of six patients have have very particular HLA type BRB1110.57. And you know the the proposed mechanism is that uh, these patients who develop drug-induced vasculitis they have some genetic predisposition. Uh, towards developing uh, uh, drug-induced um, ANCA vasculitis. Um, then uh, what does, you know, as I mentioned that, you know, it's such an overlapping, you know, you what like primary ANCA vasculitis and um, ANCA vasculitis uh, secondary drug use have exactly the same symptoms and same way it presents, but uh, very important, what is the difference between these two? So first of all, the primary ANCA, it usually recognizes only single uh, antigen, uh, whether it be MPO or PR3. So the antibodies are only made against one antigen. Uh, but on the contrary uh, to that, drug-induced ANCA vasculitis can have multiple um, uh, you know, antibodies, um, uh, or like it can uh, form antibodies against multiple antigens 
Um, uh, second thing is uh, very important to know that uh, they usually have extremely high titers with drug induced vasculitis. Well, the theory behind that is uh, these uh, antibodies, when they are formed uh, from drug induced, they are in low. They have very low avidity, and they require in very high amount to produce a vasculitis. I will give you an example. I am fortunate or unfortunate. I would say I am fortunate to have both anca vasculitis, primary anca, and drug induced anca in my practice. And uh, this this patient uh, when presented with the primary anca, you can see the titer. Initially, one is two eighty, but you know uh, we rechecked it. It was one is to three twenty, but. I, in comparison to that, the, the patient we are presenting today, you can see one is to 10,240. I mean, it's like 30 times more than uh, uh, the uh, uh, titers from primary anchor vasculitis. So you can see that how um, uh, high the titers are in drug induced vasculitis. So clinical manifestations like primary anchor vasculitis, um, you know. It can be very as subtle as um, um, uh, you know, arthralgia, malaise, fever, myalgia, and weight loss. Our patient did have joint pain and like severe weight loss for uh, for a few months before presenting. Um, or it can be as uh, uh, severe as damaging, you know, causing intraalveolar hemorrhage, uh, producing cough, dyspnea, and hemoptysis, having renal involvement leading to RPGN. And very rare manifestations have been reported in case reports like pericarditis, myoderma ganglionosum, uh, meningitis, and sensorineural hearing loss. So lab abnormalities. Well, you know, as I uh, mentioned in my previous slide that uh, they have anchor antibodies to multiple antigens, but very important that 80 to 90% of drug-induced anchor, they actually are positive for p anchor. And almost all of the patients uh, uh, have antibodies to MPO rather than PR3. Um, and same thing happened in our patient too. She had very high MPO titers and uh, positive for Pianka. Then second is, uh, again, multiple antigens. Uh, then I mentioned, I have been talking about multiple ANCA antigens. We know of MPO and uh, we know of C ANCA and P ANCA. But there are actually other um, uh, ANCA antigens which have been studied. Uh, you know, these are the three studies and uh, the other antigens uh, which have been attributed to uh, drug-induced ANCA is like MPO, HLE, uh, Cathepsin G, and Lactoferrin. I'm not sure if we can test. I've never tested uh, these other apart from MPO and uh, um, uh, PR3. Uh, but um, uh, I, I there's something to... Uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, if you don't see MPO, we can uh, order maybe outside tests to see if we are we have strong suspicion of drug-induced anchor vasculitis for these um, antigens. Uh, then uh, urine analysis again, you know, it causes glomerular inflammation. Any inflammation in glomerulus leads to proteinuria and hematuria. Typical picture of glomerular nephritis. Um, then um, a CT scan of the lungs uh, can show nodules uh, which um, uh, were absent in previous imaging studies and um, it can cause, uh, it can show alveolar opacities because of intraalveolar hemorrhage. And then uh, you can see large airway inflammation or stenotic lesions and uh, sometimes uh, pleural based lesions too. Uh, again, HRCT is much better to look for above mentioned changes and uh, should be pursued if we uh, don't see these changes clearly on the CT scan. Uh, then, uh, because it's an autoimmune disease with uh, you know a lot of inflammation going on, the inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP can be elevated. So, uh, you know, uh, the, this is like in general all the vasculitis, um, uh, drug-induced vasculitis uh, you would see. But since our patient had hydralazine, I did find some uh, you know information about. What is the peculiar uh, thing about hydralazine induced vasculitis and what are the characteristics of hydralazine induced vasculitis? So um, basically, uh, uh, um, it has been shown in uh, you know, a couple of studies that uh, hydralazine induced vasculitis has an incidence of 5.4% in patients on 100 milligram per day. Um, and it, it can go up to 10.4% uh, uh, in patients uh, taking uh, medication 
at a dose of 200 milligram per day for more than three years. And uh, predominantly it is seen in patients who are slow acetylators. Uh, then uh, this study was published in 2009. They studied 68 patients with hydralazine um, induced vasculitis. And they said that predominantly it was happening in uh, females. And mean duration of drug exposure was 4.7 years. And the mean dose was 142 milligrams per day. Um, our patient was on hydralazine for four years and she was getting uh, almost 150 milligrams per day of hydralazine. And then uh, they also, uh, in, in the same study, they said that, you know, renal disease was very common on presentation, uh, up, up to 81% of the cases. And patient also had other serological evidence of an autoimmune process, uh, including 96% had ANA positive, which our patient was ANA positive indeed. And 26% had anti-DS DNA antibody positive, I think our patient also had uh, anti-DS DNA positive. I think it was level was 10. And then 44% can have hypocomplementemia. Uh, then, you know, this, uh, they, the, uh, this study by Choi et al. and Kumar et al., uh, they studied 323 cases of ACA vasculitis. Among those cases, 12 uh, patients were exposed to hydralazine. And um, 8 out of 12 patients had pulmonary infiltrates and uh, one had uh, hemoptysis. Only six patients had renal biopsy and all of them had posse immune presenter GM. Um, so the mean duration in this study uh, of therapy was 22 months with a cumulative dose of 146 grams. And the median age was 70.3 years with all patients being Caucasian, 58%. Well, they're just, uh, I'm just mentioning this percentage, but it was just 12 patients. But anyways, 58.3% were female and um, um, uh, 12, all 12 patients in the study had elevated anti-MPO antibody. Uh, so the identified risk factors in conclusion of these studies, uh, they said that hydralazine-induced acavasculitis uh, can happen when uh, uh, there's a cumulative dose of more than 100 gram. Uh, other risk factors as female gender and thyroid disease. Our patient, well, I have to calculate if it was 100 grams or not, but uh, she, like it's, it's a female patient we are talking about and she did have hypothyroidism. Um, then they also mentioned that, you know, some HLA DR4 genotype, uh, which I mentioned in the minocycle study also, that they had slow hepatic acetylation and they can be at risk of uh, developing uh, drug-induced vasculitis. So very important to know, does the uh, duration of drug use matter? Well, you know, it actually matters and why it is important to know that somebody would think, okay, for example, our patient has been on hydrazines for four years and why would something happen now? Actually, more the duration of the drug, uh, this uh, uh, Von Schmiderberg, they, they, they kind of studied that uh, longer the duration, it gives more time for extensive generation of these reactive intermediates, which results in sensitization of T cells. Uh, again, leading uh, to uh, you know production of the antibodies. So, uh, what are the challenges in making a diagnosis? First of all, you know, often we do not recognize, uh, like in general practitioners, and uh, basically we are not aware of a lot of drugs which I mentioned that can cause this um, uh, uh, you know uh, symptom of drug-induced vasculitis. Then again, the timeline uh, sometimes it can lag by four, five, six years after you start somebody on a particular drug uh, that, that you see these vasculitic symptoms. And then, you know, again, um, if uh, we are suspecting, uh, you know, uh, it's very important that we order, you know, we don't order the ANCA antibodies and then uh, the diagnosis is missed out. Um, so what is the diagnostic criteria? It is based on 1994 Chapel Hill um, and they said that obviously signs and symptoms of vasculitis and association of these symptoms should be temporarily related, meaning somebody is having this weight loss and hematuria proteinuria since last one year and hydralazine was started six months back. That's not, you know, that that's not the case. Uh, it should be like uh, hydralazine has been started for a long time and then uh, patients develop these symptoms. Then uh, serum ANCA is positive, especially with multi antigensity. And then finally, the other conditions which mimic vasculitis, 
especially infection and malignancy and other definable types of vasculitis have been ruled out. In this case, we, uh, we did end up, I think, a timely care doctor end up doing a PET scan uh, to rule out any malignancy uh, because of you know, severe weight loss uh, in last one year. Uh, so treatment, you know, it is basically, it's, there is no standard protocol, but uh, it should be individualized. Uh, stopping the drug is uh, true for, you know, like all the drug-induced vasculitis. That should be the first step. Sorry for a blurred slide, but I think still we can able, be able to see the slide. But uh, the first step in management is withdrawal of the drug. We should avoid re-challenges and consider avoiding similar drug class. Uh, then, you know, if somebody is having non-specific symptoms like myalgia, arthralgia, which is unexplained, and um, uh, you think that it might be vasculitis, it's, uh, it's a wise decision to just stop it right away. And uh, just by withdrawing uh, the medication actually can um, um, uh, cause remarked improvement in uh, these symptoms uh, within, a, within a matter of one to four weeks. If there is organ involvement, we do use immunosuppression therapy with uh, corticosteroids and uh, either cyclophosphamide or MMF or rituximab. Um, if somebody has severe organ involvement like RPGN or pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, we do recommend that, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically to do pulse dose therapy, um, like we did in our case, and followed by this combined corticosteroid and immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, with massive pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, uh, you know, plasmapheresis is recommended. Again, the there was a Paxivas trial which studied role of plasmapheresis in treating primary anchor vasculitis. They said that, okay, it's not that useful, but this is such a rare disease and there's no randomized trial for drug-induced anchor. So I, I think it's reasonable to do if we ever come across a patient who has mass, massive pulmonary hemorrhage uh, to consider plasmapheresis. So maintenance therapy, why it is very important to know about whether to give maintenance therapy or not. Maintenance therapy meaning, you know, once we uh, do induction therapy um, and, you know, take uh, acute control of disease, uh, decision on uh, continuing the immunosuppression for a few months to up to years uh, to see, uh, to, you know, make sure that disease does not come back. Very important to know that primary anchor vasculitis, it is an essential, absolutely essential thing because it is a recurrent and relapsing disease. But in drug induced anchor vasculitis, it's still not very clear. And this, there, this, this was a short study published in 2008. We studied 11 patients with, um, uh, you know, propyl thiouracil induced anchor vasculitis. And um, um, every one of these patients came off immunosuppressive therapy in 12 months, except two patients who required renal you know, transplantation. Uh, so um, uh, more importantly, these patients were studied for 45 months and no relapse was noted in these patients. So it should be individualized. I'm not saying that we should not give mental therapy, but uh, it's not needed most of the times. And should once we do induction therapy, we should closely monitor for relapse of the disease. Uh, but it's not still, you know, uh, not very clear. It's not a rule of thumb like primary anchor vasculitis that we have to give um, uh, these uh, toxic immunosuppressive therapies for a long duration. So treatment response usually in one to four weeks, uh, generalized symptoms usually results. Um, and um, uh, sometimes, you know, it can lead to a chronic kidney disease and that can take a lot of time to uh, uh, resolve it. Sometimes it does not resolve. The patient end up with chronic kidney disease and end up on dialysis. So prognosis. Uh, so from the data of retrospective studies, um, you know, uh, the overall prognosis is better than primary anchor, but I, I, I think it's still a very bad disease to have. Um, um, I, I did find out, uh, you know, the, uh, not the prognosis, but, you know, the, the, there are a few studies, you know, you can see that um, uh, they uh, studied the outcome of hydralazine induced vasculitis. Uh, this study, three out of four patients died. Uh, then this study, um, you have these studies, you know, there are patients, a lot of, lot of deaths in these patients. Uh, we have few survivals too, but, you know, again, these are very small uh, case reports or case studies, and uh, uh, we cannot just rely on saying uh, to generalize that prognosis is very bad. Um, so take-home points: very important that you know it's it's the occurrence of drug-induced anchor vasculitis is rare, and it should not preclude 
the use of drugs mentioned previously we have to be very mindful and very uh, you know aware of the possibility that if somebody comes with unexplained symptoms we should you know just look at the medication list and make sure that the these patients are not on the drugs which i mentioned in my previous slide um, uh, uh, because that can be a early sign or warning of drug induced vasculitis again treatment approach should be based on individual presentation but discontinuing the offending agent should be done in every case uh, use of immunosuppression is sometimes needed in severe cases with organ threatening presentation and prognosis is better than primary anka vasculitis and then maintenance therapy is not essential in every case but having said that it was a very small study so we have to be very mindful and make sure that we i mean it's as part of our job that we should be kind of uh, monitoring them closely so coming back to our patient well after getting the pulse uh, dose she was discharged home on 1 mg per kg of prednisone there was slight improvement in serum creatinine post pulse but you know considering um, and then we decided on obviously the choice of chemotherapy or the immunosuppressive therapy um and uh, because of a lot of comorbidities very frail uh, body habitus bmi of 18 chf copd we decided to not use cyclophosphamide and uh, uh, use rituximab um she got one infusion of rituximab in um, uh, recently like to like couple of months back and um, um unfortunately one week after the first infusion I went into acute hypoxic respiratory failure and sepsis from multifocal pneumonia Thank God she survived it, uh, but you know currently immunosuppression is on hold. She's still recovering from pneumonia and effect of it. But uh, um, again, you know this happens with these uh, very frail patients that you know use of these heavy duty immunosuppression can be very uh, detrimental. You, we have you have several questions. We should try to take time for that because right. we're running out and of time. That's it. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank thank you. Super. Yeah. So stay on though because there there are about. 12 questions we're not going to get through all of them but one one common theme was why did this patient have pleural effusions and is there a more systemic inflammatory reason for that what is the connection between this and drug induced lupus Anyone so uh, remember i mentioned that they can have because it's an autoimmune disease of uh, they they can be presented with uh, uh, basically uh, plural plural disease also but having said that the cardiologists seem to think that it was because of her heart failure um, and not because of the uh, drug induced vasculitis um okay so dr heinick okay. says seems that hydralazine should never be used and you're saying no these things are rare you can still use the drug well you know sometimes we don't have any option and if you ask cardiologist is who who said that um because if you ask cardiologist i think that's they they i think 80% of their patients are on adalazine and you know i mean it's kind of, i cannot say to stop using it because it a lot of times we don't have any other options it's just that something to be mindful of uh that it can cause uh these symptoms of vasculitis and we have to recognize it early and explain to the patient also before starting that it can potentially happen um and uh, something to keep in mind and let the patient know that let us know if you have the any of these symptoms which are unexplained so that we can stop it right away because stopping early actually is uh, uh, shown to be very uh, effective in uh, not causing further damage Uh, from this drug induced vasculitis but having said that so at brown my my uh, uh, chair of uh, nephrology he said that in 30 years of his practice he has um, uh, prescribed hydralazine only once and all the patients he has on hydralazine were prescribed by cardiologists so it's kind of something which is independent practice but sometimes we don't have any other option uh, rather than using hydralazine So there's one question about the uh, renal artery stenosis if there's no difference in outcome stenting versus medical treatment why do we even pursue the diagnosis is so it just going with medical treatment? so i think there's two issues here one is that sometimes we don't know the cause of the renal disease and the patient presents to us and we want to know and once we see vascular disease we don't go any further but it is sometimes important to tell the patient that they have vascular disease Um, so that they understand the implications of it. 
So one is just the, the, not, the knowing part of it. The second issue is that often we do pursue it in patients who, um, and the ones that we do pursue it are those who we have very difficult to control high blood pressure or decreasing kidney function. And th those fall into a group just like that latter patient that I presented, that there is something that we, we have to do to help the patient. Um, so those are the two instances, but as a screening tool, no, I would not do it. So there are a couple more questions, but I think I'd better get to my poll because I'm rapidly losing my audience here. Um, so I think if people have further questions, I'd suggest directly emailing Dr. Grief Shastri or Gandhi. Uh, 